Jason, the data format. Thank you, Jason, <laughs> for the introduction. Uh, I do have the slides available for those who want to have a copy of the slides or follow along with them. You should be able to get them from that speaker deck link. So today we're going to talk about large language models briefly, just to you know set the stage um, for that terminology. Then go deep into RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation. Uh, go and look at this open source RAG chat app solution that can be deployed on Azure. Talk about how to evaluate RAG chat applications and talk about observability for RAG chat applications on Azure. So just to start off with talking about LLMs. Uh, so LLM stands for large language model. It is a model that's so large that it achieves general purpose language understanding and generation. So a, example I like to give is sentiment analysis, which is you get a you know a sentence and you say whether it's positive or negative. In the past, what we would traditionally do is we'd train a custom model with you know trained data that said, here's a sentence, it's positive, here's a sentence, it's negative. And then what we would get is a model that could classify sentences as positive or negative. And we would specifically use that sentiment now model when that's what we needed. But in, with an LLM, we can just do this. Uh, we don't have to specifically train the LLM to know how to do it. It just is able to do it because it's just seen so much data and been trained on such a large data set. And one way you can think about the size of an LLM is how how uh, how many training operations it's had. So the, these graphs here are in terms of training flops, which is floating operations per second, I believe. And what you see is that there's this jump when they've had 10 to the 24 training flops, they suddenly achieve this ability to do really, really well at these general purpose tasks. And these are the classic ones that they do, like modular arithmetic, word in context, et cetera. Um, so that, this is the observation that they had is that if they threw enough data at it, they threw enough compute at it, then they uh, you know, achieve these general purpose models. So you can, you can call them universal models, foundation models, large language models. Um, but the point is that we can use them for a wide variety of tasks. And that's really, really exciting. Um, and it, it's kind of like, I don't know, I feel like it's lowering the barrier for more folks to get involved with, with uh, AI and using models because you know you think of a task and you're like, well, maybe I can just use an LLM to do it. Maybe I don't have to, you know, train one and learn how to do training well. So there are lots of LLMs in use today, ones that are both hosted on you know company infrastructure and also ones that are open source that you can even download to your computer and use. Uh, so you know the hosted ones, the big one, of course, uh, are from OpenAI, and that's the GPT models, like GPT-3.5, GPT-4, whatever GPT is coming next. Uh, Google is also in the game here. It, you know, it put out Palm was like a year ago, and now it's put out Gemini, and Gemini, you know, looks like it might be pretty impressive. Uh, Anthropic is a company. I think they forked off of OpenAI, and they recently put out the Claude Three family, which seems to be pretty powerful. And then we've got the open models. So there's a lot of open models coming from Meta, like uh, the Llama Llama model, uh, and that one has kind of variety of sizes. And then there's also this company Mistral AI that's been putting out some models as well. Uh, yeah, I see a question from uh, Rajnish. Yeah. So yeah, can you go back to the last slide? And I just want to understand yeah. when you say this, um, um, like uh, model scale training flops. So what does it mean like mod arth arithmetic, mod task, NLU and word in context? What does it mean? These are tasks that they get the models to do. So mod arithmetic, this is modular arithmetic. Uh, so typically we wouldn't expect like a language model to be able to do modular arithmetic since it's not trained for math. Uh, but you can see that its accuracy does jump to like 35% when it has been trained on a later, enough data, be, just because it ends up seeing modular arithmetic a lot in the data. Um, this one is multitask natural language understanding. I don't remember exactly what that test test looks like. Um, and then I don't remember what word into context looks like. So I have to dig up the paper uh, to remember what these what these tasks look like. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so and I see a good question about hallucinations, so I'll certainly talk about that throughout it. Um, so what we see is there's a variety of LLMs, so some of them are hosted, and these are the, the, the most powerful ones you can really only use on someone else's infrastructure. Um, 
unless you're willing to go through a lot of effort to figure out how to, you know, host one of these powerfuls and set up the GPU and all that stuff. But you can totally get started running with these smaller models locally. I recommend using Olama. You can see I've got like a little llama up here. Uh, and here I've got it running. I typically have it running over here. Yeah. So let's see, emojis for Boston. I always use it to generate emojis. Uh, so this is with Llama 2. So I just write a Llama run Llama 2. And what that does is that it pulls down the model if I don't have it already. Uh, and then it lets me just chat with the model. So here are some emojis to represent Boston. So we get a building, a park, and a person walking. Those are pretty good ones. I like to walk around Boston when I go there. Uh, so I do recommend playing around with Olama. It's the easiest way to get started with these open models locally. And it's just fun to have an LLM in your terminal. They're not as powerful as the models. You'll definitely get more, you know, hallucinations um, as, you know, Lucas was saying. Um, but uh, there's a lot you can do with it, uh, you know, especially if you just need a quick, a quick emoji, quick poem, uh, that sort of thing. So one thing that you might want to know about terminology wise is GPT. What does that stand for? It is Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. That's what the OpenAI models are named after. You'll also just generally people talk about, hear people talk about transformer architecture. So that architecture was actually first described in a research paper from the Google Brain team. So it's funny that, you know, OpenAI came up with the GPT models first, but, uh, you know, things happen. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing how this architecture actually works and you like reading research papers, uh, do check out that paper. That's where I got this diagram from. Um, but basically this transformer architecture may, it, uh, was much better for language because of its ability to see multiple parts of the like kind of input the sentence at the same time. So that's my very Sim simplified and probably not quite correct, uh, you know, understanding of the transform architecture. There's more in the paper and there's also some great videos for fo from folks that are actually machine learning experts that explain the attention architecture more. There's also fantastic videos from Andre Karpathy, who is a machine learning expert and he was just, uh, he was previously at OpenAI and at Tesla AI. And he's got a great talk, State of GPT. And then also he has a series where he builds GPT from scratch in code using Python notebooks. So that is a really cool series. I still haven't made it through the whole series because it's a little intimidating to build entire GPT. It takes quite a few hours. Uh, but every time I watch his videos, I, I just learned so much. So if you want to dig into how these, you know, how these GPT, this transform architecture actually works, that is what I recommend. So how do we actually use these uh, these GPT models from OpenAI? Uh, one way you can do it is in Azure Studio. I'm guessing some of you have already done that. Um, so please, you know, in the chat, uh, let me know what your experience so far has been in terms of using OpenAI, Azure OpenAI, that sort of thing. Uh, so there is this, you know, studio that you can use. You can get to it from the um, from the portal. Now, the first thing you need if you're going to use Azure OpenAI is that you do have to fill out a form in order to get access. And in that form, you have to say what your usage, your expected usage is going to be so that Microsoft can say like, okay, that sounds like a good responsible use of, um, of OpenAI. Uh, and then once you've got it, then you can deploy all these models. You can see I've got quite a few, <laughs> I have quite a few deployments because I spend way too much time doing this stuff. Um, so. Let's see, I can go to my model deployments and then open those up in Azure OpenAI Studio. Load, load, load. Oh, here we go. Oh, I'm just going to. All right, so I'll go to Azure OpenAI Studio. There is also something called Azure AI Studio, which is different from Azure OpenAI Studio. I tend to only use Azure OpenAI Studio, um, but Azure AI Studio is where you'd go if you're, you know, using other models, making your own machine learn models, that sort of thing. Uh, I think eventually they're going to merge the two, but right now we've got two different studios. So this one's really fun, just the chat playground. It's just a, you know, just a wrapper for playing with the API. So we can be like, you know, write a haiku about Boston. 
and it'll send it off. And we can see Harbor City's charm, Boston's history unfolds, proud spirit endures. Okay, so that's cool, but maybe we want to change the system message. So, so how do we find more, more, you know, you're an AI assistant that uses so many emojis. Okay, so I'll change the system message. I'll apply the changes. And now I'm going to ask it to write a haiku about Boston again. And there we go. We can see a lot more emojis. Let's also, we're talking about hallucinations. We can say, what is the weather in Boston? And those of you who are in, in Boston, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, it's still doing haikus. And it's gave me a range here. So what is the temperature today? I'm trying to get it to lie, basically. Uh, okay, so sometimes it does this response where it says, I'm sorry, it's an AI, I don't have real-time data access. So that's good. Uh, it's, you know, it's better when the LM doesn't try to make something up, but let's just try to force it. So I'm going to change temperature to one and top P to one to try and increase its creativity level. And we'll see. Yeah, it still is refusing to answer. That's good. So sometimes you can get the LLMs to to uh, mix stuff up, and uh, depending on you know how it's been trained, sometimes it won't do that for you. All right, so that's a little playground, and you can also grab code from here. So once you've played around with something, you can actually grab the code. Uh, you can get it in. You know they've got different ones. They've got curl, C sharp, Python, and JSON. <laughs> I'm not sure what the JSON's for. Uh, I typically use Python, and so most of the code you're going to see me using today is in Python. So as you can see here, here is an example in Python. Uh, so we pass in the conversation. So when we're working with these chat-tuned models, so we call them like chat-tuned models, uh, so like uh, GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 are chat-tuned, which means they expect their input to be to look like a conversation. So we typically start off with a message, which is the system prompt. So it has role system, and then it has the system prompt, and that gives it just overall tone, format, expectations. Uh, and then we have the question from the user and then and we can also keep going so we could pass in, you know, multiple back and forth um, so that the, you know, the chat model could see what messages happened before. Uh, we can choose to stream the responses or just get the whole response back at once. So LLMs can be really great. You just saw we could get it to you know, write haikus and use poems and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, as Lucas was saying, like, you know, there's uh, it can make stuff up, right? And it can answer things incorrectly. And why is that? Well, one is that LLMs uh, have always have outdated public knowledge, right? Because they train the LLM, you know, on the Internet up to a certain point and then nothing after that. Right. So if we asked about something recent that happened, it would, you know, it would have no idea. Uh, the other thing about LLMs is that they do not have access to anything internal. So if you know if you have data that's inside your internet, there's no way that an LLM is going to know anything about that. So if you're trying to ask company specific data, it's just not going to know, right? So those are you know the limitations we run into, and then we try and figure out like how can we work around these limitations. So there's you know three general techniques to incorporating domain knowledge. The first technique is to do try to do prompt engineering. This prompt engineering is only going to work if the data is inside there inside the weights somewhere, right? Like, let me see if I can do an example of this. Um, so I'll say um, write SQL alchemy code. Uh, that's a particular Python package for SQL databases. Okay. So yeah, so it did this. This is the old way of writing SQL Alchemy code. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get it. I don't know actually if it's seen the 2.0. I think it has code using the declarative base class. Let's see if I can get it to fix itself. Oh, it says SQL 2.0 doesn't exist as of my knowledge. So yeah, unfortunately, in this case, it can't do it. So what I was trying to show is the, the fact that if, if, you know, imagine there's you know, two different versions of a library in an LLM's weights, you can often 
get it to, you know, pick the most recent one if you're giving it a hint that that's what you're trying to get it to do, right? But that only works if it's in the wait somewhere, right? In this example, it actually didn't even have anything in its, you know, in its training data at all. So we couldn't get it to come out with the code. So prompt engineering is generally not going to be that helpful when we're trying to incorporate specific domain knowledge, only helpful if it is actually somewhere in those weights and we're trying to steer it. The next approach people talk about is fine tuning. That's where you actually are kind of training a subset of the weights. And so you would repair like, you know, maybe thousand examples or, or more. And those examples would be, you know, examples of, uh, you know, user questions and chat answer. And in that way, the LLM could actually learn new skills permanently. So it's a very, it's a, it's a, you know, effective way of getting an LLM to, you know, updates it, its weights to learn something more. However, it is expensive, right? It's expensive to do the fine tuning, and then it's more expensive to run, uh, to, you know, to use a fine tune model than to use a base model. So I actually personally have not done any fine tuning myself. I haven't felt the need, <laughs> but, uh, and, and a lot of people have talked about where, you know, uh, you could do fine tuning or you could just use the 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 you know the most recent model and that is generally going to be better. So fine tuning we like to consider a last resort because of the ex, you know expense involved, you know the time and all that stuff. Um so it is it is a tool in our toolkit but it's not the thing we should necessarily reach for immediately. The technique that I like to use is retrieval augmented generation, which is a way of just giving the LLM the facts just in time, right? Um, you know, for example, with the SQL Alchemy one that I just showed, if I, you know, wanted to make sure it really did, um, you know, answer something correctly, well, I could just give it information. I could just say like, well, you know, um, you know, here, write a model or a restaurant class based off this example, right? So I'm basically gonna like give it current code and see if it can learn how to do it. Yeah, it got a little bit better there, yeah. Uh, so the idea here is that we, you know we're we're going to give the LLM the information to answer a question based off the domain data, and we're just gonna, get, gonna give it to it at the point where it's answering the question so that it can see what we want to answer the question based off, and it can still use its skills of answering questions on that provided data. So I have one question, if you don't mind. Yeah. The previous, uh, so where does the few shot fit into in this? Um, yeah, that's question. a good question. Um, yeah, I should I should do like an updated version of this. I actually, I did talk about that in a presentation on um friday uh so let me find yeah ways to improve llm output so few shot examples uh so we could even do that in the playground too you can add examples and this shows the chat what responses you want uh so i would say few shot examples are the most useful for format they could also help, like in this case with SQL Alchemy, like it might be enough to get it to write the syntactically correct SQL Alchemy code. But usually few shot examples is more about learning the format that you're looking for and less about the knowledge. Because um, typically your, your few shot examples are gonna be the same across all the questions, but the knowledge for each question would actually be different. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so that means the few shot would be for the formatting and for the, you would use the rag or uh, fine tuning if it is knowledge based, is it? Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I can show examples because we do use few shots for our, you know, for our formatting to try and show the LM this is the kind of format we expect. So we use few shots in combination with rag. So it's definitely a good tool to use few shot examples, especially when you're trying to get a particular format, particular length, that sort of thing. Um, but it's, uh, I would say it's complementary to RAG. Got it. And, and, and irrespective of uh, which LLM we use, is that 
uh, same how we interact with uh, with the foundation models in terms of let's say if the fish art is the way that we do it for gpt would it be the same for the cloud uh, do they follow the same uh, in a similar way to interact with them yeah, generally, generally that would be similar. Um, you know, you know, you, you see people talking online uh, online about what prompt engineering and few shots they're doing for Claude and, and other models. There are some differences in terms of um, if you're going to do something with like function calling or JSON output. So there, there's a a lot of people try to get the LLMs to output structured data. Uh, like if you're trying to get it to output a JSON that, um, you know, like you pass it a news article and then you say output a JSON that has the title of the article, the top, you know, cities mentioned in the article and the top people mentioned in the article, right? So doing like an, an any analysis to get JSON out. If you're trying to get JSON out of an LLM, that actually is going to vary based off the model because some LLMs have like specific uh, kind of API endpoints in order to to get JSON output because they've been they've tuned it for that. Uh, and with like the OpenAI use the tools parameter to the API, um, uh, but not all the not all the APIs support that. So the main difference I've seen so far is if you're trying to get structured output out of the LLM, the way you do that per model uh, may vary. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so. Retrieval augmented generation, let's dig into this. So let's say we have this example here. Do my company perks cover underwater activities? And I actually have, I have this one open. Let's see, is it over here? There we go. Yeah, I'll even try it again. Do my company perks cover underwater activities? Let me zoom, zoom, zoom. Mm -hmm. So it is going off and trying to figure out the answer to this question. And it should be doing it in, and this one's, this one is actually running locally. Okay, so there we go. We see underwater activities such as scuba diving are covered under the Perks Plus program. Now this is a chat that's specific for a fictional, fictional company's data. And it's managed to answer this question. And it does that using retrieval augmented generation. So how did this actually work? So we get the user question and we use that to search a knowledge base, right? So this knowledge base, it's either a search engine. In this case, it's Azure AI search. Uh, it could be a database. We're searching some sort of set search engine. It could even be a NumPy array, actually. Like if you had a small enough amount of data, it could even be like an in-memory array. But you need to search your data somehow based off this user question in order to figure out what are the pieces of knowledge that could help an LLM answer this question. And then we take that, you know, we get that information back and we take that and the original user question, we send it to LLM and say, hey, answer this user's question based off this data and make sure you cite your sources. And then we get back this answer that says, yes, your perks do cover some underwater activities like scuba diving lessons. So this is the general approach to RAG is that we're getting the search documents back, the search results back, and we're passing both the user question and the documents to that LLM call. And we can actually see that here if we click on the thought process. So first we, uh, you know, we search using this query and we get back search results from Azure AI search. And these are snippets from employee, you know, employee HR handbooks type stuff. And we can see, you know, the page number and all that stuff. So we get back these. And then this is the actual conversation we send to the model. So we have the system message and the system message says you must do it according to the data and the sources below. Then we have the user question. And actually here is where you can see we do have few shots. So we have an example of a question and sources and an example answer. And that's to show it how to do citations, right? Because we're trying to get citations in a particular format, I'm just trying to make it bigger, 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 right? So we're saying like, okay, this is an example. This is how you answer. This is, you know, how you give those citations. And then, and then we have the actual user question and the sources that we got back. And these are just concatenated, you know, with new lines. 
And that's it. That is what we send to the LLM. So that is the heart of retrieval augmented generation is that you send the the information along with the question and the LLM is able to look through that information in order to synthesize an answer. The Sudhir have a question or okay. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Pamela? So Pamela, how like what is this? Is this a Python based uh, web UI you have developed and then how you have developed like what what you are actually trying to achieve from this how you have developed this ui if you can explain that it will be really great yeah so i'll dive deeper into the actual code for this this is a this is all open source it's a react front end with a python back end and i will i'll i'll step through the code as part of this presentation in a bit sure thank you mm -hmm. all right so sure. as we can see yeah yeah i just have one small question so yeah. When it comes to RAG, um, and this might be just, you know, your experience, but how do you balance the amount of data you're actually putting in either that vector DB or, you know, I'm kind of trying to understand this because I've heard these scenarios where people throw in just mountains of PDF files in a vector DB. Does that, then I get to the point is like, well, can I just search the vector DB and what do I need the LLM for? So I'm trying to understand the kind of like the balance between, you know, how much data you have in there or the quality of the data, or does it even matter? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if, for example, in your case here, you have the HR information. Do you just basically put the entire, every single PDF file you possibly can find and you just scrape it and put it in the vector DB and you're pretty much going to be uh, getting quality results or do you, you know, how, how do you balance all the splits or whatever comes in? I'm just trying to get a better understanding of that, if that kind of makes any sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so here you can see these are the only bits of like chunks of documents. Uh, so when we're doing RAG on documents, we do split up the documents uh, into chunks that are about this this size here, about like 500 words. Uh, so we, we split up the documents into these chunks uh, because the whole thing is that we don't want to send too much. I actually think that might be my next slide so okay 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 i can hold off uh so yeah so as we see rag is beneficial okay so yeah let's talk about that search step and the, what the data looks like right um so we need to get good results to the lm or we're not going to get a good answer and yeah it's, another point is that what is the lm actually doing right the lm in this case, it's synthesizing information. So we're basically, I think of RAG as making search more accessible, right? So people, they don't want to have to search and click through multiple documents and like synthesize information in the head. So we are using an LLM to synthesize information and present it to the user in a concise way. Um, but really it's, it's, it's really like kind of just, you know, making a more friendly search interface. And as it turns out, like people like people like having a more friendly search interface where they just feel like the answer is right there in front of them. Um, but in fact, like we do need to focus a lot on that search step because in order to get a good answer synthesized, we need to have really good search results, right? If we if we give the LLM garbage, it's gonna output garbage. Um, if we give it gold, you know, it sh it it, sh it should, you know, I'll put gold. Uh, so we want to figure out how can we really make those, you know, those search results be really helpful for the LLM. So our general goal is to come up with a small number of searches, uh, search results that contain the answer. Uh, we don't want to like we don't want to find too much information because if we send too much information to the LLM, it does tend to get a bit lost. Like either if we send too much information, either it just won't find the answer at all because it'll kind of just ignore it if it if it's just too much being sent at it, uh, or if that if we send so much information that we kind of have conflicting answers in there and we have some information that's like misleading in there and doesn't actually answer the question, the LM could get misled and answer the the thing wrongly, right? So we really want the search step to find the most relevant documents and nothing more. Uh, and not too many documents, right? So in my example, I'm only retrieving three documents. Between three to 10 would be the usual. Um, 
so that's we we don't want to send too much. This there's this paper here, lost in the middle, uh, where they were you know, looking at how many documents you could send, and basically, like as you sent more and more, the accuracy went down because the LLMs would you know find it too noisy to find the answers in that large chunk of information. Uh, so you can see here we only got the three document chunks back, and uh, and and you know these chunks contain the answer and they don't contain too much more that is that's the goal um as to like you know how many documents do you throw into your search index i mean you do want to throw in everything that could possibly answer a question that a user would have i i, I think that's that's true you just want to throw it in in a way that you're going to be able to to you know search well um on that data later uh, because you don't want to just send your you know too much information at an lm so when we're doing the actual search, uh, we want to use the best search strategy for searching with the, you know, use it, use your question. Uh, these days, everybody's talking about vector search. A vector search, it means that you turn the user query into a vector and, uh, you know, a vector using like the open AI uh, embedding models. And it basically like that vector encodes all this kind of semantic stuff about what's what's in that text. So if you had a user question about dogs, then that would end up, you know, in this similarity space where it's similar to cats because dogs and cats are both pets. So they are semantically similar, even though they're spelled completely differently, right? Uh, so, you know, this example here, I asked about underwater activities, but the word underwater is nowhere in the text at all. Instead, the word scuba diving is in the text, but underwater and scuba diving are both similar in the vector space. So that's why everyone's talking about vector search, because it's a way that we can, uh, you know, we can get results for things that are semantically similar, even if they're spelled completely differently. So we definitely want to do a vector search so that we can, you know, find those semantically similar things. We still want to do a keyword search because vector search is not good for some things. And this is something I want to stress because there's been such an obsession with vector search because we're like we're all like discovering it now that people are forgetting about keyword search. But um, but keyword search is still necessary for some stuff. Like if I search for like an exact you know number, like you know what costs you know, 1999, 1999 is not going to do well in a vector search. Or if I search for an exact name, like, you know, everything about Pamela, Susan Fox, I want that to be done with a keyword search. That's an exact name. I don't want, you know, things that people that have names like me, right? I want Pamela, Susan Fox. So we still want to have keyword searches done as well. So we need a search strategy that's going to do a vector search, going to do a keyword search, and then is going to combine those together, right? Because you get both those results, right? So you search using your, you know, your full text query, you search using your vector query, you get back results. You need to somehow merge those results together, you know, remove duplicates, figure out, um, you know, which which scored higher. And then you want to, you know, you need to have some sort of way of ranking the vector versus the keyword search. So what uh, people often do is they use a re-ranking model. So this would be a machine learning model where you say, hey, here's the search results. Here's the user question. Could you please re-rank these search results in the optimal way? Now, this seems like a lot of work, and it it is actually because I was actually trying to implement this this morning myself. <laughs> so typically we, I use Azure AI search because it just does all of this for you and it's very, very good at it. Uh, so I do recommend Azure AI search, but if you were going to do this on your own database, then you know you have to implement it on, on that database and you can often find examples of how to do that. Um, but the thing I want to stress is that you want to get the best results and a small number of results. And generally the way to do that is with a really good hybrid search. So you, whatever you are using as your search engine, make sure that you can get good results from that using a hybrid search. Uh, I see a question from Robert in the chat. Is there a way to leverage a company ontology for vectors and taxonomies for keywords? Uh, like we provide documents to the LLMs. Um, yeah, that's a good question. When you just do the vectors, you're generally going to use like the open AI models because they're quite they're quite good. If you had your own ontology, I mean, one thing that's interesting that you could link into, this isn't publicly out yet, um, but 
I think it should be out in the future. This is called Graph Rag because it sounds like, you know, you've got an ontology already. Uh, so let me link to this here. Um, and it actually, like, in order to use Graph Rag, I think you have to actually define an, an ontology. And uh, they they say it works, it can work better for some, some types of rag. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. I haven't had a chance to play with it myself. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you could also do like custom weighting with your searches and stuff like that, but I haven't dug much more into it beyond that. Uh, Rajanish? Yeah, I have a question. Suppose you have a millions of records in a database, then you are going to go through millions of records, create a vector out of it, and then what is the keyword? I think then that case is going to be very, very slow uh, for the model to search those many records, isn't it? So, yeah, so am you I understanding use wrong? It. Yeah. yeah, you're right. So doing a brute force vector search would be quite slow. Um, what uh, you're usually going to use an index, either HNSW or IVF. Uh, the, those are the two main ones. Uh, like Azure AI search uses HNSW, so you just tell it which kind of index to use. And this does, as you can see, fast approximate nearest neighbor search. So it's using heuristics in order to be able to quickly search um, across. So this is the current one that's the most popular and that's supported really well. There's also IVF and there's also, I was even reading, uh, and people are really experimenting with this space and how to how to do uh, vector search faster. So this is an article from NVIDIA about doing uh, GPU powered vector search. So it is a very hot topic, uh, but you can generally get pretty good performance with HNSW and uh, you can do it with Azure AI search. You can do it with Postgres. Um, so hopefully you can use one of those indexing algorithms with a, whatever database you use. I think Thank I you. was uh, watching some videos nowadays of people are talking about graph databases. As a mm. Uh, yeah, I saw somebody post on LinkedIn about doing, what is it, like Neo4j or graph databases with RAG. I didn't read into it to see what particular approaches they were, they were using, uh, but uh, that is definitely something to link in, look into. So I don't know, Mindy, if you have any videos or articles you want to put in the chat, that would be very helpful. All right, uh, and I do also recommend reading this blog post from the Azure AI search team. Uh, so aka.ms slash rag relevance, also just put it in the chat because we have this nice chat here. And it really nicely demonstrates, uh, you know, the differences between just doing vector, just doing keyword and doing, you know, hybrid and ranker. And, and you know, for those of you interested in like, you know, how do you decide how to index documents. This is just a really, uh, really fascinating article. So what does it really look like to do a RAG with hybrid search? So this is just my diagram before, but broken down a little bit more, right? So we get the user query, we take that user query, and first we actually send it to an embedding model like ADA002 or even one of the new embedding models from OpenAI, and we get back that vector. And so then we take the vector and the text and use both of them to do a hybrid search, which will get back the merge results. And then, you know, with those results, we send both the results uh, and the user query to the large language model and get back the, the answer. So this is still actually even simpler than what we actually do in the app, but I'll I'll talk about that soon. Uh, but as you can see, there's various steps involved here in doing a proper RAG with a hybrid search. Now, another thing to think about is what is your RAG searching? Uh, is your RAG searching documents or, you know, what I would think of as unstructured data, or is it searching like rows of an existing database, right? So imagine, 
uh, you know, you have like a, an online store and you wanted to have a rag where customers could ask questions about your store items, right? So those I think of as actually being two fairly different rag situations. And a lot of times when people are talking about rag, they're talking about rag on documents because that's, I think, where people are really like, I don't know, I think maybe because it's harder <laughs> and that's where we tend to focus on it because it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, trying to figure out how to ingest all those documents, but you could also totally do RAG on database rows and, um, and you can have a really com compelling experience with that too. So do you have any articles? I actually, that's one of my, um, kind of a research item to do. Uh, do you have any articles you could share on how to do database rag? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was actually working on it this morning. Uh, so I intend to put out various samples so you can see um, posts from this morning. So the first thing I did was I implemented a hybrid search for Postgres, um, po you know, PostgreSQL and with PJ vector. And so you can see the search, right? So I pass in a text and a vector, and then I get back results. So if you can implement hybrid search on your database, um, you know, it means you do to have some sort of vector support. So with Postgres, I use PG vector. Um, various database extensions have different ways of storing vectors. So hopefully there's one in your database of choice. Once you do that, it was actually really easy just to swap it in to my, um, you know, to the app that that I've been showing. I just kind of substituted the Azure AI search call <laughs> with the call to the uh, hybrid search endpoint for the Postgres database. Uh, but I will be putting out uh, some repos around this to make it easier for folks. So I just want to be clear. So it's it's like you are able to scan the whole database schema and then ask questions in natural language? Or did yeah. you just, okay. So when I do, I I said best shoes, and that um, that turns into a, a hybrid search query on the well, in this case, just on the shoe table. So I did have to decide what is this going to, you know, what fields. That's the thing you have to decide if you're going to be doing rag on database rows. You have to figure out which, what are your target columns like? Are you going to be actually searching? across all the columns or just one column and uh, when you make a vector are you going to make a vector for each of the columns and like search on each of those vectors or what a lot of times people would do is you know the kind of you can do like stuff it so you you would concatenate all the relevant columns together uh, and then compute the vector for that so you would still just for each row have a single a single column for the embedding for that row, as long as it encoded all the stuff you thought would be semantically relevant. So that's that's actually the decision that you have to make is, uh, you know, how many how many embedding columns are you going to have, and and what is your you know full text search going to search as well. Yeah, so that's a great question and definitely something we need to talk more about and have more examples for. Uh, so, so yeah, if you're doing database rows, you do need to figure out a way to have vector support um, for to be able to have a vector column and to have efficient search, right? We were talking about indexing, right? So you need a database that has support for vector indexes. So you're looking for support for HNSW or IVF. Those are like the efficient vector searches. Uh, or just looking for a native vector database, um, you know, that's an option too. So on Azure, uh, the options we have here are, you know, uh, for database rows, you could do Azure AI search. If you wanted to copy the data over, that's also an option. If you're okay with having a copy of the data, Azure AI search can connect to various databases and, and index it, uh, but then you'd have a copy of the data. So, you know, if your data changes a lot, you might not want to do that. Uh, you can do as your Postgres flexible server plus PG vector. You could do as your Cosmos MongoDB plus their new vector support. You could use container app services uh, with these built-in vector databases like Milvis, Quadrant, or Weaviate. Uh, and of course, you could use the OpenAI embedding models in order to actually, you know, compute that column. So that's RAG on database rows and 
I haven't done that as much as saying like I only really did it this morning <laughs> to make sure that, you know, to to kind of prove it. Um, what I've spent much more time on is rag on documents, which we can also think of as unstructured data. So that's just whatever documents you have, PDFs, docs, PowerPoint, HTML, markdown, images, all of those are things you could potentially uh, you know, ingest into a search engine. But for that, you do need an ingestion process that's going to Take that document, extract the data from it, split it into good sized chunks. Because remember, we don't want to send too much information at an LM. Then, you know, compute vectors for each of those chunks and then store those. <clears throat> so on Azure, the best option for that is definitely Azure AI search uh, in combination with document intelligence for the extraction and open AI embedding models for the vectorization. Uh, so how would you actually build a rag chat app on Azure. There are various solutions ranging from no code to low code to high code. My emphasis is always high code, but I will show the no code and the low code options because, hey, if they get the job done, that's great. The no code option is Copilot Studio. And, you know, this is really meant to be, you know, the, a user friendly, friendly way of setting up your own Copilot. So you can say like, oh, here's, you know, make a Copilot based off of this blog, right? So I tried making one based off my blog and it'll, you know, it'll try to do all the ingestion and indexing for you and give you this chat interface. Now, the thing about Copilot Studio is that I actually don't really know how it works behind the scenes, right? It is. Uh, it's you know kind of a black box. Uh, I do work at Microsoft, but I don't I don't actually know how to like find the code behind these things. So I actually don't know how is it doing the ingestion, how is it doing the searching. I don't even know actually if it's using GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. Um, I'm trying to ask around just to find out for my own edification. But generally, if you're going to use a you know a no code option like this, it's you know you're not going to be able to have that much flexibility, right? You're not going to be able to really, um, you know, extend it if you realize it's not working for your use cases. Uh, so it's always good to start off with these things just to see, does it work for your use case, especially if you have like a really low stakes use case. Um, but then, you know, keep in mind that you'll probably reach a wall. Now, the next option is actually a really compelling option because it actually has some code that you can mess with. And that's the Azure AI, OpenAI Studio on your data. So I think I still have this open here. Yeah, so you can actually go to this Add Your Data tab and add a data source and you can click, you know, Azure AI Search if you have an existing index or you can use Blob Storage, Cosmos DB, Elasticsearch. Uh, I think they're using, even adding Pinecone. You can specify a web address, upload files. So they're trying to figure out what are the common data sources that people want to use and make it easy to connect to them. Uh, so it supports, you know, all sorts of documents because you can use Azure AI search. Uh, you can upload documents to it. So lots of documents. Uh, it's kind of supports databases in that you could connect your Azure AI search index to a database, um, but I don't think it's really uh, kind of, I don't think it's really geared for databases. I think it's a little more geared for for documents, but uh, but there is a Cosmos, actually, I mean, there is Cosmos D for Mongo V Core. So yeah, so you could try that out for, for that if you've got your data there. And, uh, and yeah, and how does it do the searching? It's got lots of different search options, right? So even some non-Azure ones like Elasticsearch. And you can choose whether you're gonna use three, you know, three, 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 five or four. So this is a pretty cool one because actually once you you can make it and you can deploy it entirely from the studio and if you want to extend it you can actually get the code for it from their repo. So I believe that this you know this is the code that powers it. So if you do deploy it and you like it you can try to actually change the code if you need to make some tweaks. Now there is still limitations to this because I'll I'll show the code um, what it's doing, let me find the relevant bit of code. Uh, trying to find the chat completion call. <laughs> so a lot of options here. Chat.completions.create. Okay. Mm. Send chat requests. Okay, I haven't looked through their code in a while. Uh, stream sharing. Okay. <sighs> 
Let's see. Yeah, okay. It's kind of hard to find it, but um, what it does is actually using a particular parameter to the chat completion. Yeah, these are basically the parameters. So it's actually telling the chat completion API, like, hey, here's the Elasticsearch index. Use this index and search it. So, and behind the scenes, the Azure chat completion API knows how to do this. This is only on Azure. You can't do this with OpenAI, um, you know, on openai.com. You can only do this on Azure right now, at least. Uh, so it's doing the search for you. So if you, if this works for you, great. If you end up needing more flexibility over like the searching step and like how it's actually combining the search results with the, you know, with the system prompt and the user message and, and all that stuff, then this, you know, this may not work for you. So you may reach a wall if if you find you need to uh, you need to extend the actual RAG flow more because this basically is like RAG orchestration as a service. So it there's code going on behind the scenes that's figuring out how to get the search results and how to you know how to answer a question based off the search results. Oh, I see a question from Robert, like, what do you map it to from? So you can map stuff like if you're doing like Elasticsearch with, you know, with Azure Studio on your data, you have to tell it what's the title column, what's the URL column, what's the content column, what's the file name column. So if you're, you know, if your data matches, you know, you know, works with the assumptions they're making here, like the assumptions here you can see is that you have a title and a URL and a file name and a content. So it's definitely assuming some sort of document based drag. But if the, if you're you know if that works for your RAG use case, then the as your OpenAI on your data could work really well for you. So lots of folks do start off in this add data um, and and deploy that, and um, and some of them you know stick with that and that works well for them. Uh, and then if it doesn't, then you can go to the full very high code uh, solution. And this is the one that I spend all my time on. So I, you know, I know, you know, that on your data a little bit, but I basically spend like way too much of my time on this on this repo here. Uh, it came out in March of last year and it just became really super popular. So you see it's got 5000 stars. So it's actually the most popular Azure sample in our Azure samples repo. So it's been deployed thousands of times. So we've got lots of feedback from it. We we're continually, you know, improving it. You can check our releases to see, you know, the sort of things we're changing. Um, and it's all based off of feedback from, you know, Azure developers, Azure customers. So it's been a really great way to learn about how to make a RAG chat application and see all the different ways people are trying to use RAG chat apps. And it is, I would say, the most flexible of all the options because, uh, you know, it's it's open source. And if something isn't working for you, generally you can go in there and mess with it. Uh, it is very much a high code situation. Like the, the code is not necessarily simple. <laughs> we, we try to do that, but it's not always going to work uh, to make something simple. But, um, you know, it's very flexible and, and that can be the advantage of it. So it currently it's geared for documents and for the search engine, it's only Azure AI search. So that is certainly, you know, a limitation if you were trying to use like Elasticsearch, right? Um, but generally Azure AI search is the best way to search documents uh, if you're, you know, using Azure services. And that's why uh, we use Azure AI search. For the LM, you can switch whatever you want. Uh, so you can, you know, have these multi-turn chats, so, you know, con whole conversations. We've got user authentication built in. We've got access control built in. So if you wanted some users to have access to different files than other users, that you could do with this. Uh, you can even use GPT-4 with Vision. We have that as an experimental feature that you can turn on if you're interested in trying that out. So a lot of this stuff are features that you can kind of turn on if you want to see if they, you know, if they work for you. OK, so now I'm going to dive into that solution. So in order to deploy this, you need an Azure account and subscription. Uh, you can use free account, but it has an awful lot of limitations. So usually better for not using a free account. Uh, you do need access to Azure OpenAI or an OpenAI.com account. You could use either of them. 
you could even use Olama if you really wanted. I sometimes I do that just to see how the local models do, but they don't do very well. So I would recommend GPT-3.5 or GPT-4. Uh, you do need Azure account permissions to be able to create the RBAC roles uh, and to make the deployment. So those are you know prerequisites to deploying. Uh, and then to open the project, you can use GitHub code spaces. You can use VS code with dev containers. We like to set up everything with a dev container so that it's all, all the requirements are set up for you. Or you can go ahead and set up a local environment if you enjoy doing that. I do not. <laughs> and then you can deploy using the Azure Developer CLI. Uh, I don't know if you all have talked about the AZD CLI before, but it is by far my favorite way to deploy things to Azure. Uh, basically, what we do is we define the infrastructure using BICEP which is infrastructure as code files like Terraform. So we define all the infrastructure in BICEP that's just in the repo. And that you know declares everything that needs to be provisioned and how they relate to each other and the environment variables and all that stuff. And then we just have to run you know, AZD up in order to get everything provisioned and everything deployed uh, in, you know, onto the platform of choice. Once it gets deployed, what you end up with is a bunch of Azure services. So for like the chat application itself, that's on Azure App Service. And it uses Azure Blob Storage in order to render the documents and the citations. Uh, it uses Azure OpenAI for the embeddings and the large language model calls. And it uses Azure AI Search for the searching. We also do data ingestion in this repo and that one also uses all those services as well as Azure Document Intelligence. So there's two ways that we do data ingestion. So this is another opportunity where we're going to talk more about data ingestion. So if there's any additional questions, uh, like from like George, um, this is a good opportunity to to ask them. Uh, yeah, one so, question I have for, yeah. for data ingestion. So if it's a document and it's unstructured, I mean, it's just text in a document. So if you wanted to feed it text from your database, I guess, why would it need to have specific like vector indexing or anything special like that if you want to just, you know, all the fields of this one table you know are all the same type of text data no different than you'd scrape it from like a document um so so you're wondering about scraping from a database yeah as data source yeah if you're using a database as a data source you do not need any of this right so i i probably still have my let me find my um here we go okay so if we were going to do, you know, um, this, this is like the code for my Postgres hybrid search. It, it's not perfect yet, but <laughs> but here I'm just doing, uh, you know, so I just have like, you know, you, you just need to have a database that has, um, you know, you've got your columns here and then you've got an embedding and you have to decide whether that embedding is going to be the embedding of just like a single, you know, field, like just the description, or you could concatenate all these together and make an embedding based off that. So that's probably what I would do is concatenate, uh, you know, all like the text fields together, the things that kind of have semantic gotcha. things in them, concatenate them yep. into one okay. thing, generate the embedding based off that, store that as an embedding column. So you can see here, like this is my schema, um, right? So I've got all like my standard columns and then I've got a vector column for the embedding. And then when I do the search, I need to do the vector search with that column and then the keyword search. Uh, right now I'm only searching one column, but probably I should do that across multiple columns, right? And then I need to you know, merge those results. Uh, but yeah, if you're working off a database, you don't have to have all this fancy data ingestion. You just really need to have, uh, you know, ideally have an embedding column. You could even just use, I mean, you can also just do it. You could do just a full text search. I, I think you're, you would be happier if you also had a vector search and a hybrid search on top. Um, but you just need some way of searching your database based off a user query. Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, great question. All right, so yeah, so data ingestion, this is really relevant to documents, right? Imagine multi-page documents, your HR documents, that sort of thing, right? So we get the documents. First thing we do is, uh, you know, upload to blob storage. Actually, that's even the last thing we do. Um, uh, so we get them to blob storage at some point, just so we can, and that's just so that when we have the actual app where we can um, click on, let me see. So I'm gonna click on, I'm gonna click on a bunch of citations and see which of them loads 
first because sometimes these PDFs can be a little low to slow to load. Okay, there you see. So it loaded the um, this you know this PDF PDF here. Uh, and this one was this one is a rag based off my personal blog, <laughs> which is fun for me. And so here you can see it actually loaded the HTML, right? Uh, so we, you know, we need these things stored somewhere so that we can, uh, you know, show the citation. So this is coming from blob storage and it's actually checking our um, user authentication when it grabs it. Oh, that one's going to be slow. So we put them in blob storage just so we can render citations. Um, the next thing uh, is that, you know, we have the documents and we need to extract data from them. So. Uh, you, we typically use Azure Document Intelligence because it supports a ton of formats these days, including DocX and PowerPoint, which was really huge for people when they added that earlier, uh, you know, I think in the fall. So it, it supports lots of documents, even supports images. It does OCR. So it really tries to get as much text as it can get out of a document. We do also have local parsers that we make available just because they can be cheaper or mo more customizable. Like for my blog, I actually just use the local parser for HTML because I then I can just do some custom parsing for HTML and, and uh, leave off the parts of my blog I don't want, like the comments. Uh, but generally, the you know approach is to use Azure Document Intelligence because it's very good at document extraction. Now we have the text extracted for the whole document, but we still need it in chunks because we can't send like a 10 page document to an LLM, or at least we shouldn't because it's going to get lost, right? It's going to be too noisy for it. So then we split the data into chunks. Uh, so we have all this, you know, Python code that looks for sentence boundaries and also tries to, you know, split things appropriately so that they're a good, um, you know, a, a good size to send to an LLM. Uh, there's lots of other splitting libraries out there, like in Langchain, that you can use as well. Then once we have the chunks, for each of the chunks, we compute an embedding of that chunk. And then finally, we put them in Azure AI Search. Uh, and I can show you once again the results, right? <clears throat> so this is actually just straight from Azure AI Search. Uh, so this is what the index looks like. So we can see the content and we can see the embedding. We've got like an ID. Uh, we've got scores that come back from the search. That's only relevant, you know, that we don't store that. That depends on the query. Uh, we've got the, what page it came from. And we also have access control related information if we're using access control, like uh, the user ID and user groups. So this is a local script. Uh, so this is actually like just in the repo. Um, if you know if I wanted to ingest something right so I'll go ahead and run it just to show you also Jason you can remind me if I'm like going way too long there's lots of good questions I don't... no you're fine Wait. okay let's see all right I'm just gonna see if I can ingest something just to show you okay so I'll go here and let's see what environment I'm in right now. Okay, it's a good one. Okay, let's see if my ingestion script is working at the moment. I'm always doing so much hacking on this repo that you never quite know what state it's in, but on my machine, it's, it's good on main. Okay, so just running the, the script here. And it's just setting up, well, first it has to set up the environment to bring in all the, you know, the Azure Document Intelligence SDK and uh, all the other things we use for, for the extraction and ingestion. Any questions as it's running? So I have a quick question in terms of the cost wise, right? So, for example, you know, like you were saying earlier, uh, when when we use uh, fine tuning, it's definitely more expensive because there's a tokens involved and a lot in the same thing. Would it be more expensive when we use rack, or is there a way we can reduce the cost using any kind of caching in it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think you could use caching of user questions because I think your user questions would be so. Um, so different. I'd I'd be impressed if users were were actually asking the same thing. Uh, generally, like ways to reduce costs. Well, I'll say this: What are the expensive things? Uh, 
you know, there's app service, but app service actually isn't too expensive. It can, it can handle a fair bit um, it, without getting too expensive. Azure AI search does cost uh, a bit, especially if you're going to have, if you need multiple replicas for the amount of traffic you think you're going to get. And especially if you use the semantic ranker, which is their re-ranker, which is actually, you know, the best thing to do is to use a ranker. But both of those are the things that make it the most expensive if you increase the replicas and you do uh, keep the semantic ranker enabled. So if you want to decrease Azure AI search costs, you disable the semantic ranker and you keep at one replica if that works for your traffic levels. Uh, the, your other approach with Azure AI search is, you know, to replace it with a, you know, with a, you know, a, a database search engine, um, you know, like the Postgres one I was showing. But then you do have to re-implement everything that Azure AI search comes built in. And they are putting a lot of effort into RAG because RAG is such a use, big use case for them right now. Uh, but, you know, that's just a decision to make. And the other big thing that costs, well, Azure Document Intelligence does cost money, and and uh, it can it's a that can be a decent amount if you have a ton of documents. So if you're trying to reduce cost there, you can use a local parser and see if the quality is good enough. It depends on your kind of document. Um, I don't think it's that the local one's that great for PDF, but if you're doing HTML, you could do a pretty good job parsing that. Uh, and then finally, Azure OpenAI costs money. Uh, you. That one, you can't really reduce the cost except for just making sure you're not sending too much data, right? So it, it's per token. So the less you send, the better, right? So if I do three search results, that's generally going to be cheaper for me than doing, uh, you know, five search results. Got it. <clears throat> Thank you. And then Vishal asked, uh, does this service need GPU or CPU? No, this one doesn't because we're using Azure OpenAI as like an API that we're hitting up. Uh, so that's, you know, that's sort of somewhere that has GPU. Nothing that we're doing requires a, a GPU. We would need a GPU if we were running our own model, uh, but we're not running our own model for any of this. All right, so here you can see um, that it did decide. Thank you. That it, uh, yeah. It skipped a bunch of things because we'd already ingested them. Then it decided to ingest this PDF. So first it extracts the text, then it splits it into sections, then it uploaded the file, and then it computed the embeddings, and then it stored it. So that's just what the local script uh, looks like. Now, the other option we have is integrated vectorization. This is something that's now built into Azure AI Search, which is basically just doing everything we just saw, but in the cloud hosted, you know, with, uh, you know, geared for, large you know large scale uses uh and it has a little it supports a little bit more um data sources right because azure ai search can be you can make indexers so it's basically making indexers and skill sets and tying them all together so you can have your indexer based off like blob storage or cosmos db or whatever and azure ai search will you can run like a cron job and basically like every five minutes it would check to see oh is there something new in blob storage and then re-index it and only index the the things that have changed so if you use integrated vectorizations, you can take advantage of the indexer, which can work well if you want to be able to like, you know, have it pulling off of some data source dynamically and only indexing the new stuff in that data source. Then it'll do the it'll do the data extraction. And there I think it's just I think it is using document intelligence behind the scenes. It'll do the chunking using a similar splitting algorithm. It'll use the vectorization using your open AI deployment, and then it'll index it. But the big advantage here is that you know it's doing it all, uh, it's doing it all in the cloud, and you can connect it to the indexers. So that is an option to consider if you're using Azure AI Search, uh, and it's an option you can turn on in the repo that I've been showing. Okay, so how does this code actually work? Okay, so let's do a little code walkthrough just to see. <clears throat> all right, I'm actually going to go to the chat tab now because this one's more fun. Uh, does all right. So let's see. Actually, let me go ahead and um, and point put a breakpoint in. Let's see. All right. Let's see. Can I do run? Okay. All right. I well, I don't know if you're gonna want watch me <laughs> do breakpoint to book. It can be a little slow. All right. I'll just I'll just put one breakpoint and then display. So this is in VS Code with the uh, the Python debugger. Uh, I like to use the debugger when I can because I am very often debugging things. <laughs> so it'll it'll start up. 
But basically what we have is a, uh, a front end that's in React. So we have like, you know, this chat, you know, chat React stuff here. And when we, you know, type in a question, it's going to make a request to the chat API, right? So the slash chat. And that goes to our, you know, Python routes, right? So we look for slash chat here. Where is it? Boop, boop, boop. Chat, chat. <laughs> oh, that went that went to the wrong place. Okay. App dot mini app dot pys okay okay so the front end makes this request to the chat sends a post with the user's message and the history and then sends that to our other python and sometimes it streams it if we ask it to stream otherwise it'll just send it back all right so we should be running now <clears throat> so we'll say uh do company perks Hover underwater activities. It should, let's see, my chat retrieve. Yeah, it should pop open the, um, I think it should pop open in the debugger. Done. Are there libraries so you can do this from a C-sharp project? Yeah. Uh, so if you want the C-sharp equivalent of this project, it is this repo here. So uh, the other advocates have been trying to port the Python repo into other languages, uh, but you know because the Python repo is so popular. Uh, the other ones aren't as popular yet, but you can make them popular by going into them. I think, Jason, haven't you been? I feel like Jason, or maybe Jason's been on the JavaScript one. I saw Jason committing to one of them. Yeah, I, I committed to the JavaScript one. I'll the JavaScript put one. the links in. So I've reviewed the different ones on oh, my blog site. I'll put the links in the uh, chat for people. OK, thanks, Jason. OK, wait, it's it's being too slow. So anyway, so I'll just show the, the thought process. OK, so right, so you know, we go into the Python. Uh, and now I just wanted to show the chat tab because it's a little, it's actually more complex. And I think it's interesting the way and it's more complex. So this is the thought process for the, for the chat tab. So what we see is the original user query and we actually use an LLM in order to turn that search query into a good keyword query. And now this might seem a little silly because all we did here is just remove the question mark. <laughs> but in other cases, it actually makes really helpful um, modifications, especially based off of the history that gets passed in. So that, you know, so we get the generated query and then we use that to search and then we get back the results. So uh, let me give an example. Like, so then I'm going to do a follow up question like, more. I'm just going to more. That's all I'm going to say is more. Let's see how it does with the um, search query generation here. My hope is that it takes more and turns it into a, a longer, a longer query. OK, I think it did. Let's see. OK, I'm going to click on thought process. OK, great. So the original user query was more. The generated search query was sleep strategy. So this is where it's really helpful to use this LLM to turn the user query into a keyword search. Because if we had just passed more into our search engine, what would we have gotten, right? We would have not gotten good results at all. Uh, so we, you know, we ask it like, hey, turn this into a search query based off of the, you know, conversation history. So the LLM realizes like, oh, okay, a good search query would actually be sleep strategy. So it's actually going to just redo the sleep strategy from four. And then it's asking the LLM down here, it, it with the LLM, it's saying, it tells it the question where it just says more, right? So the LLM can see like, oh, you wanted more sleep strategies in addition to the ones before. So when you are doing, you know, what we call like multi-turn conversations, you know, conversations, whatever you want to call them, when you have chat history, you need to keep in mind that users are going to 
ask follow-up questions that are not going to be as well formed as their original question. And you can use the LLM in order to turn their follow-up question into a much better keyword query for your search index. Okay. All right, so I wanted to show that. So, you know, there's the general architecture of the code. And uh, now our code is using, you know, Python for the back end, and it's just using the OpenAI SDK with the Azure, you know, document search SDK. It's not using any fancy LLM orchestration libraries. And people always ask, like, why aren't you using LangChain? Why aren't you using this? Why aren't you using that? Well, part of the reason I'm not using any of those is because everybody has a different favorite library for Python, and I'd have to pick one of them, and I'd, and then that would, like, alienate other people, right? So <clears throat> there are many popular RAG orchestration libraries, and you could totally use those as well, you know, whichever one works for you. Uh, so the most popular ones in the open source world are LangChain and Llama Index, and both of them are available in multiple languages. And then from Microsoft, we've got Semantic Kernel, which is probably the most similar to LangChain, uh, which is, that's in Python and, oh, I should have said .NET. That's really what it is, is .NET. We will we'll fix that. Python and .NET. I don't think it's in TypeScript. Um, I obviously haven't used it very much or at all. <laughs> and then there's also Microsoft Prompt Flow, and that's built into Azure AI Studio. So it works really well if you're using Azure AI Studio and doing other machine learning model stuff. So you can totally use these libraries. Uh, you know, I tend to not use any libraries because I like to work really, you know, really close to the metal uh, because things are changing all the time and I want to be able to take advantage of everything. Uh, but these libraries do have a lot of advantages as well because they have like documented, you know, ways of doing things, right? So Llama Index, for example, it actually has a way of indexing into Postgres and doing a hybrid search uh, just already built in there. So they've already got that that built in. So definitely if you're, you know, looking to do search on documents and you're looking to do it with, you know, you know, various, um, you know, search backends, check out Llama Index. They have all these different retrievers, all these different document parsers, lots and lots of options. And we also have more starter repositories. So we just talked about actually a bunch of them. So the, you know, this Python one, we're trying to port it into other languages. They're, they're never going to be exactly the same. And generally the Python one tends to have more, more features or at least more experimental features because we're just working on it so much because it's so so popular but you know we're you know the if we get more more eyes and more developers uh interested in these then we can you know the teams can spend more and more time on them which would be great because we would like to have full featured rag applications for all languages so if your favorite thing is c sharp definitely check out the c sharp repo it's actually been around for quite a while um it, it came out at a similar time as the python one so it's it's got a good number of features and then there's javascript that team is great and there's the java one so those are definitely options for you and if you're seeing something missing in there in there those repos that you want just file an issue and let them know uh, there's also ooh, uh, the one that i showed earlier which is the code that powers azure ai studio on your data uh, so you can check out the code for that uh, another one is Chat Copilot, and this is a demonstration of Semantic Kernel, but it is actually really, really cool. It has collaborative chat, which I think is just really fun. Um, so just putting it there, especially for those of you who are doing .NET, which is probably quite a bit. Uh, I see a question. Will the demonstrated code still work with a free account, even in some limited way? What are the limitations? Yeah, so that's all documented on, let me see. Uh, yeah, this ACA. Uh, I'll just place this, okay? Yeah, so I did try to figure out how to get it working on free, and so you can get it on free, and I talk about all the limitations here. Although I will say there is no form of free OpenAI. <laughs> You're going to have to pay for that somewhere, whether that's on OpenAI.com. You could even, you can actually swap out Olama. I, I do have support for that in the repo. I think I talked about that here. Yeah, you can, locally, you can use an OpenAI compatible model. Good question. All right. Okay, so it is now 4.30. Is this the time I'm meant to be over, Jason? 
sorry, looking for the mute button. Um, it is, but uh, if you can go ahead and go through this and say 15 okay. minutes. Sure. Yeah. So I won't do like the demo, like demo stuff. I'll just talk about this. So, okay. So let's say you, you make a rag chat application and you want to know, is it good? Right. Is it high quality? Right. You can't just write unit tests. I mean, you should write unit tests for the features, but you can't just write a, a you know, a, a test to say, yeah, it's good to go. You need to I, uh, evaluate the answer quality. Right. So you want to know, are these rag answers correct relative to my knowledge base? Right. Uh, are they clear and understandable? Usually. Uh, and are they formatted in the desired manner? So if you ask for citations in bra square brackets with file extensions, that is exactly how the citation should come through, right? So that's the stuff we're looking for in our RAG chat app answers, right? So here I have three different answers that came for the same question. My favorite one is the bottom one because it answers the question correctly and it has the citation in the right format. And that's what I'm looking for. Lots and lots of things affect the quality, and that's what can make it kind of <laughs> hard to, you know, to figure out how to improve, uh, improve quality, right? So the first thing is the search, right? We talked about search is really, really important, right? So what search engine are you using? Are you cleaning up your query? Like, what are your actual queries come in that, that they look like? Are you using hybrid search? Uh, any other search options you're using? How big is your data? Like how large are your chunks? Uh, you know, are, do they overlap with each other? How many search results are you turning? These are all things that can affect the results. And then finally, we, you know, we pass things into the large language model. So there the system prompt can affect things, especially like whether it uses citations or not. <clears throat> uh, the language of the prompt, if you're doing something not in English, you should actually write your prompt in that language instead if you want it to output in that language. Uh, how much conversation history you're passing in, which model you're using has a huge effect. Generally, QPT4 is much, it's like, it's just really good at things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, model definitely has effect. I use QPT3.5 a lot, uh, but I've definitely seen places where GP4 was uh, just nicer, better, but more adherent to the instructions, I'll say. Temperature can affect things. All these parameters, right? So, you know, what do you do? Like, first thing you do is just do manual experimentation, right? So in our, you know, in this repo, um, we can experiment using developer settings. So we can, you know, override the, the system prompt here. We can change the temperature. We can change our search results. We can do all these other, you know, changes to the search results. And so we could just do manual experimentation just to get a feel for what changes when we change these settings. And so that's a good thing just to get some more intuition for how things are working. But then what you really want to do is to do an automated evaluation once you think you've found settings that work well, right? If you if your manual tests are working well and you're like, okay, I think this is working well, then you want to do an automated evaluation on a lot of um, question answer peers to figure out is it really working well, right? Across lots of questions and answers. So the first thing you're going to need is ground truth data. That ground truth data is the ideal answer for a particular question. So you generally want at least 200 ground truth question answer pairs. Uh, you can use an LLM to generate these question answer pairs, but you should definitely curate them manually, go through them, make sure they're actually legit and, um, you know, and, and grounded. Uh, I have this script here. Okay, so I have this repo, AI rag chat evaluator. Let me uh, put, put this in the chat, which everyone will let me click on. There we go. So this repo has a bunch of tools that I've made to make it easier to evaluate a RAG chat app. So one of them is a tool that generates ground truth data and it uses this Azure AI uh, evaluate uh, SDK. So this will generate data based off an Azure AI search index. Uh, you could ch change it if you have a database instead, you could just modify it. Uh, and so you could you know, generate that data, look through it, curate it. Uh, if you've got your rag chat live, you could add like thumbs up and thumbs down buttons to, you know, the actual answers to find out which answers aren't working well for people. And then you should add those questions with their correct answer to your ground truth data to make sure that you're evaluating according to the kind of questions and answers that users are getting. Now, once you've got that ground truth data, the next step is to evaluate, right? So the way we're actually going to do evaluation is hit up our you know our, our current version of the app uh, whether that's local or deployed or whatever but hit up the version we want to test with the question from the ground truth data 
get the the you know the new answer and then we send you know the the new question you know the the current um answer for that question along with the ground truth answer for that question and we actually send that to gpt4 and we ask gpt4 to rate it and we say hey gpt4 from one to five how grounded was this answer from one to five how coherent was the answer from one to five how relevant is this answer and our prompt is a lot longer than that but the general idea is that we use gpt in order to evaluate gpt which is a funny thing to do but it actually does work quite well and there's a lot of research around it uh, we can also do other ca calculate other metrics as well like look at how long it was look at whether it had citations look at whether the citation in the new answer matched the citation in the ground truth answer that's actually my favorite metric and that we can just do you know with our python so then after we run those evaluations we can compare them so you can see here's a bunch of comparisons i was doing where i was playing around with different prompts uh, there's lots of things you can change but in this case i was changing prompts and so I was looking at, you know, what was the groundedness and coherence and then, you know, which of them had citations because that's really important to me. So I can look across the runs to get an idea for how well things are working. And uh, it can also compare answers between runs and say like, okay, well, what was the answer like for this run versus this other run to try and get a feel for how things changed. And yeah, I'm going very fast through this part. So as Jason said, I do have a um, a whole video about evaluating a chat app and he linked to it there. So thank you, Jason. Okay, so that's evaluation. I definitely recommend doing it because you want to make sure you're putting out a you know a quality application that isn't making stuff up. Uh, and the, the uh, you asked about hallucinations earlier. Uh, I have a recent, I think my most recent blog post is actually about it. Yeah, so. I added a metric specifically. Well, this isn't quite hallucinations. This is just making sure the app says it doesn't know if something's just completely off topic for it that it shouldn't know. So it's slightly different from hallucinations and something it should know. But this is also something that's really interesting that I've been digging into lately. OK, uh, and just a few slides about observability for RAG chat apps, especially on Azure. <clears throat> so the first thing you might want to do is integrate with Azure Monitor, because that's our standard way of you know, uh, tr tracing our apps on Azure. So you can use instrumentation libraries to send uh, the OpenAI traces to Application Insights. So this is how we do it in Python using this library here. And then when we look in Azure Monitor, we can you know see the nice little water flow and then click on the chat request and we can see like, oh, okay, you know, here's the parameters, here's the actual prompt. Here's the question. So we can actually see all that in Azure Monitor. Uh, it's not perfect and we're trying to make some improvements to it, but it's pretty good. Another thing you could use is uh, an open source tool called LangFuse, and I really like it. It is a, um, a you know, it's a tool specifically for OpenAI observability, and it's also got evaluations and stuff, and it's just a really nice UI. Uh, so, you, you know, you have to, um, you know, you can deploy that UI to to Azure, and I have a repo here where you can do that. And then you just, uh, you know, bring in their tracing like this, and then you get this really, really cool UI that's very focused on OpenAI uh, usage. So it's very helpful to see all your calls and see all the tokens they use and see how slow your GPT-3 calls are versus your GPT-4 and all that stuff. And OK, this is my final slide. So uh, yeah, so if you're interested in this, you can try creating a RAG app. Uh, you know, you, and I pointed to the free instructions here so that you're not spending money doing that. And you can read about the limitations there. You can try out the evaluation tools as well. Uh, anytime you try these, please do raise any issues. Uh, I do see everything that comes in. I can't always respond the, the day that I see them, but I try to respond to everything so that we can make things better. And generally, I recommend sharing your learning. So like Jason has all these blog posts where he reviewed stuff. Like, so if any of you blog or tweet or whatever, please share what you learn about building a RAG app because I think it's still early days for this and we still all have a lot to learn in terms of best practices. And that's what I have. Awesome. That was awesome. Any uh, Any other questions out there? I think you got it all. That was great. That was uh, that was uh, really good. Uh, I, uh, I I I really gotten into the rag stuff, so <laughs> I'm 
the more that I uh, see people present it who really know this stuff is it's just fantastic to, to be there. So I think this was probably the most interactive session we've had in a very long time. Yeah, uh, you all had great, great questions. I love getting the questions because usually there's something afterwards where I'm like, oh, I really got to figure out a good answer to that question. And then it gives me an excuse to dig into something. I don't think they asked too many things you didn't have an answer to. I have to try harder next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I got to like export the chat. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, th I think that's it. Bill's going to uh, do a hands on thing after. Uh, um, so, yeah. Uh, All right. Well, hey. thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Pamela. Thank you, Pamela. That was fantastic. So sure. a quick question, Greg. Uh, okay. quick, can we get the recording of this session? Is it possible to share the recording? Yeah, um, it will be on our Boston Azure YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Boston Azure. Isn't that right, Bill? I think it's the full Boston right. Azure word, yeah. And um, it'll probably be up there late tonight or by tomorrow morning sometime. Okay, so so I should from Meetup, I should be able to access that, right? And uh, no, so it, that... it well, we I believe we do have a link to the YouTube channel in the Meetup description, so you should be able to find it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye everyone. Thank bye, you. Pamela. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Bill, are you going to take over? Can yeah, you I just re I flipped on um, uh, sharing, and it's I got to go set up permissions. Sorry, folks. Give me a second. Uh. So let's see. We have here. Um, uh, so let me share my screen while Bill's getting his ducks in a row here. So this is where we're at. Come on. Okay, cool. Bill's there. Bill's got it. Cool. Um, yeah, so you can get the recording at uh, youtube.com slash Boston Azure. That'll have Pamela's stuff. And um, I'm going to transition. Um, I can only share my um, my web browser without having to configure something. My apologies. So I have a couple of slides I was going to share. I'm going to speak to those. Um, I, what I'm going to show here is a... Um, we're, I'm, I'm going to ask you to create a simple Python app or a simple uh, C sharp app um, per you know instructions. I, um, I basically think you know how to do that. And I'm going to ask you to basically do that. And then I have some code to uh, to slam in to make it easier. The goal of the workshop, this mini workshop, is to see um, if you've been doing this for a while, the, this might not be for you. But if you're new to this and you you don't really know what the code looks like, um, my hope is that at the end of this, you'll have the aha moment of, wow, I can do this in about 10 lines of meaningful code. Not everything Pamela did, but you can actually create a program that can do something using the LLM that a programmer just before this whole LLM thing came on it was impossible to do. No programmer was able to do this in the you know before this. This is a remarkable um, change in just the way uh, the way the, the tools that we have access to as um, as developers. So I am sharing. Let's say I'm sharing in the chat two links. Um, uh, this is um, OK, so I just shared two links. Um, I was also going to go through and show you how to do this. That's going to be a little trickier now because I, I'm having trouble sharing beyond just my web browser. Uh, but here's the idea. If you're a 
a Python developer, um, go follow the Python link, you know, which is, which brings you here. And if you're a .NET developer, C Sharp developer, follow the, that one. And there are directions at the top of each file. Basically create a folder and then um, do, do a couple of steps that are normal things to do if you're a Python or .NET developer and then replace or create the, the file, if it's C sharp, you're gonna replace program.cs with um, with this file, it tells you to do that here. Um, and if you're a Python developer, you're just gonna create a file called helloai.py and you know do the stuff mentioned here. So these two links are in the Teams chat. Um, and after you do these few steps up here, there's a, there's a challenge that, um, um, that you know, once you have it running, I'll 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 speak to that. So I, I hope this only takes you know five minutes for folks, or maybe ten minutes for folks to to get running. But if you have questions, come off uh, you know go on audio or uh, post up in the um, in the chat. Bill, you want me to share anything, and you can talk to it. I had it all set up on my um, uh, it, it command lines. I. I you know, I have windows open <laughs> that um, maybe in the meantime, I can I can see if I can even extend my permissions. Um, I so no, it'd be hard to give you something to, to share, Jason, unless you wanted to follow along the lab and do that live. OK, I mean, I can do that, too. Meantime, I'm going to go see if I can enhance my permissions here. I'll share mine until you get yours going, Bill. Let's see this guy. So let me take this here. So, got an empty folder. Do this guy. Clobber the contents. Just copy and paste the code. All right, so it's here. Copy it. Paste. This guy. Save. Okay, done it, run. Okay, that worked perfectly. Oh, an interesting fact that we're on my very fast. Oh, um, oh, cool. If you, um, so I'll wait. I'll wait till per, to proceed. Um, I'll I'll uh, talk a little more be, once everybody has this at least running. I can do a 
So I try to put this code in the collab and, run, and trying to run it. I think I'm just having some issues like configure environment for Python. No module named OpenAI, some those kind of errors. Maybe I need to do a few things before. So you did the Python one? Yeah, I, I did the uh, Google Colab and then did the Python. Google Colab. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, yeah, Colab is the environment where you can run the Python code um, yeah, from Google. Yeah, oh, okay. I've heard of it. I've never used it. Okay, so let's try the Python one. Where's the link? That Python here. All right, so let's try the Python one. Open another. For the person who was uh, trying to do the Python one, you you uh, you if you have a fresh environment, I'm not sure what Colab is, but you might try it without the um, without the uh, second step. You might not need those steps. Those I do for just protection in case you have a complex environment, which makes it hard, you know hard to add global libraries sometimes, multiple versions, that kind of thing. But if you have a clean environment already, then you've already accomplished what uh, what step two um, is trying to handle. I see. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I've had this problem before. Oh, shit. So that's a Mac thing um, uh, or Linux, you know, uh, thing. My mistake. You want to run activate. Um, so it's probably just bin activate. On Windows, yeah, I can do it in code if I don't have any luck. Yeah, uh, let me look that one up. That's what I'm, um, I'm kind of handicapped when it comes to Python. So, yeah, this is the let me start over with this. Close CD CIMKDIR. Hey, hey. Oh, it's hey. activate.ps1, I think. But it's, there's a, well, actually, you, you figure it out, um, or, or if you're onto something. Yeah, I was just going to do this. So if I go here, yes, I do. Dude, trying to type sometimes challenge. Over. Okay, so now close this welcome window. So we'll take this. What do you want this to be? Hello, AI. Well, you, you uh, um, there's more to the file than that, unfortunately. Is there? Okay. It, it's above the comments, too. So you, I would just do a control A and take the whole thing in. Okay. Oh, copy, paste. All right, so what we got here. So here we have this deployment. OK, so that's that. So now we basically, I think I already have these. You might not need to do anything except just run it. Oh, yeah, actually, it's true. Um, let me just try to run it. Wait. I could have done it in a notebook. And there's oh, there a, uh, there we go. Cool. Different one, I just. Um, and there's a, uh, yes, uh, George contributed a scripts activate command, which maybe is the one that you'd need for PowerShell. I, I probably should have opened the mic, <laughs> let you guys struggle through that, but yeah. Just... <laughs> oh, oh, good. <laughs> I thought it was quick on the chat. I was like, oh, well, I know. <laughs> C sharp guys, anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, me yeah. too. Trying to learn <laughs> Python. I can fumble around and get most things working, but slowly getting there. Okay, so anybody, um, anybody have this working besides Jason? 
Either one. Can yeah, you hit it. the uh, you keep score if you want to check the I put, I put a comment in there you could respond to. You could click the checkbox. No obligation, but I'm trying to have some way to track how people are doing. All right, you got three of them now. What do they look like next to each other? Python. Anybody have any struggles they want to vocalize? Who's got it? You know, my, my struggle with these is always the cost, right? Whenever you do any of these cloud computing, especially these services like this, I'm always very leery. I mean, I actually am working on a project right now where it's all local. So our local CPU and GPU, I got a local Llama 2 model that I'm using. Um, you know, the stuff with an Azure is really awesome, but do you have any indication or you know setting up like workflows like this the cost involved i mean i <laughs> well th this one is um uh actually that's a good question i don't have a ready-made answer for that uh yeah. my perception is this is not expensive um but um but if you add uh like uh the uh, a, uh azure ai search um you know the the, the it goes up to minimum of some number hundred dollars a month. Okay. Uh, you add a vector database. You know the same thing. This is using. Um, if I could show my Don uh, graphics here, I made a beautiful. I had uh, uh, Dali three make me a nice uh, uh, visual. Um, but um, you know this is using the the tip of the tip of the iceberg, and um, this this just you're not using the the, the heavyweight uh, tools yet. Not using, um, um, uh, you know, the, res the responsible AI um, uh, services to, you know, make sure your your data is safe, the the, the safety uh, service and so forth. Yeah, you're you're in the the cheap zone here. <laughs> Very different approach is how you can minimize the cost. Obviously, you can drive it to zero, <laughs> especially yeah, as you mentioned, when you work with uh, cloud technologies. Um, but, you know, you use using Llama, deploy it on um, your local machine. Yeah. Uh, you can deploy the server, so you, you're kind of escaping that cloud approach altogether, so making it a little cheaper. And then caching. So you can cache the responses, so you are not calling the service all the time if you are using yeah. something like Azure OpenAI, um, or maybe store most popular answers somewhere in um, like a, a database or something like that. That's interesting. Um, I never thought about caching the responses that come back. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, that, that's one uh, that, that it depends what you're building, right? right. Um, so that that's one of the approaches how you can minimize the cost. Um, and then you know something like RAG, you don't have in in some cases you don't have to call um, Azure OpenAI or something like that at all. So if you're um, doing the search and then you're getting decent response from the search, then you can escape the second step of calling the um, um, LLM or Gen AI service altogether. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I never thought I got you got me thinking about maybe caching the common responses. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you. No problem. So I'm going to grab. So is anybody having any yeah. struggles? Any struggles out there? Anybody who's still here is, is doing good? So I'm going to grab the screen back and walk through a couple of things here. So, um, 
So you saw the, the output. So I, I, I assume you can see your output. And it basically shows um, a prompt that appears. I'm, I'm sh let me zoom in on this code here. The, the code is essentially the same between Python and uh, C Sharp. So um, this is the prompt that you're that is being sent to the um, under the hood, the OpenAI uh, LLM, large language model. And, uh, and this is the part that's, you know, magic. It's producing a response that is uh, unique text, uh, the, you know, uh, a, a response that, uh, the kind of a response that was impossible before this um, LLM revolution uh, started a year and a half ago. That's like just amazing. And if, and um, one of the things that I claim is if you look at the response, there's something wrong about it. And I didn't want to spoil it. I'd give folks a chance to look at the response. But when you look at the, the response, um, um, there's, there's a lack of um, grounding. Or, or the opposite, uh, the the other side of the grounding coin is uh, hallucination of sorts happening in the response. So um, I'm suggesting that um, a hint to help you uh, solve for that. Don't want to take a huge amount of time here, but that that's that's the point. And um, this response, setting the number of tokens. We can talk about these. Um, April 20th, setting a prompt, um, scrolling up here, creating this Azure OpenAI uh, you know, object. And the rest of this is kind of boilerplate stuff. Um, this is like 10 lines of code that, that you're now able to do something that no software engineer could do for the first 75 years of the compute industry. Go back here. How are we doing? Um, it, ah, so yay. Somebody declared a date bug and they fixed it. Good. Two people, three, a couple people fixed the date bug. So um, the the date bug, if you haven't figured it out by now, is actually, Jason, would you mind sharing again and showing um, showing your, uh, your output? Sure, just a sec. Let's see, so share this one. The C sharp output was here. Do you want to see the code or the output? The output. Uh, okay, so uh, this was the Python code. Either one is the fine. output is down here, and then up here is the um, other one up at the top. Thank you. So if folks look at that, you're seeing similar stuff. You know what today's date is because it's output as a debug message. Um, and the prompt asks for something from some world history event from today's date. And and it gives you one, except with great confidence, uh, on March 18th, 18, uh, 1965, uh, Soviets walked in space. Um, but uh, that great confidence is... Uh, uh, untethered from reality because that didn't happen on this day in history. It happened on a different day. And that's uh, that's your LLM hallucinating, returning a confident result when it has no business doing that. And the way to ground it is to do um, basically rag. This is this is exactly what Pamela was talking about, except that with the rag um, here, it's a much simpler rag where the augmentation is simply the date. So you don't have to make a network call to get the, the, uh, the current current date. You can just make, you know, call a, a Python library or a C sharp library to, uh, to get that and then weave it into the prompt. Uh, I'll leave that to your imagination how to do that. You know, on this day in history, you know, assuming this day is, you know, X or something like that would do fine, which is, date, whatever, you know, choose your style and see if you get uh, consistent results. And if you do, then that's that's the win. And um, and and that was the, the goal is to uh, 
to give you the, the hands-on experience, hopefully a couple of ahas. Quiet group. Thank you, Tony. In 10 lines of code, folks. If you've finished the uh, fix the date bug, another suggestion if you if you haven't explored this is to go down to the max tokens, which is the value 250. Change that to something. Don't change it. Don't make it larger, please. Uh, but uh, but make it smaller. Make it 25 or five or play with uh, those values down there. And, uh, and see what happens to the quality of your output. The token is the currency of how much data uh, the LLM will process for you. Let's see if I go to here. And if you've accomplished uh, the goal here and, and you want to try something different, you can instead of just uh, prompt engineering or, L or ragging to to get the date inserted in the in the prompt itself so that the response is uh, more accurate, better grounded. Uh, you can also say something like uh, and return the results in French. Or translate the results to German. Uh, you know, append that to your prompt and see if that works. I, I tested it earlier with Mandarin and it was happy to do that. And it also worked with Pig Latin. Um, Mandarin didn't display on, my, my son was doing some testing on me um, uh, and um, he, Realized that Mandarin didn't display well in some contexts on his Windows box. Mine is, I, I'm using a Mac. Didn't have any trouble for me. So, your mileage, if it's a different alphabet, uh, your mileage may vary. My response looks gibberish. How many? Uh, Oh, you didn't, um, no, you got 250 tokens. Used all I, the tokens, I it ran changed, out of tokens. I changed the temperature to two. I thought the temperature only went up to one. I guess two. Yeah. Most people just in between one. Veronica, help. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, temperature can be more than one. That one's a little better. Also, it, it, the the one above used all two hundred fifty tokens. This one only used fifty, so it hit some cognitive limit there when it ran out of tokens. Maybe. I thought a temperature was a was like a zero to one real number. I guess you can scale it in different ways. I know I've seen it from no, negatives like to positives and stuff too. But again, I thought it was a zero to one concept. Going into junk. At 1.7, how about 1.6? 1.5 was good. It's the top P that's who it on. Yeah, that's also gibberish. Starts off good. It's getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's past his bedtime. So, um, uh, uh, Sudhir, how to fix the date? So the 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 challenge is that um, oops, somebody um, weighed in, Tony. So um, yep, this this looks like a, a Python solution. I don't know which one you're using, uh, Sudhir. 
Yes, I'm using the Python. Okay, so Tony's solution how to do it. Basically, you just want to uh, wordsmith the prompt to also, in normal English, uh, declare what today's date is. And that becomes part of the information that the LLM uses. And again, that's a very simple form of RAG. I see, I see, got it. So the initial one, you're not actually passing what today is. On purpose. Huh. That's the bug. That's the the, the challenge. Uh -huh. the, the my my hope was people would notice the, you know, discover for themselves that there's a hallucination there, that you ask for today, something today, and it gives you something, you know, in September, and then something in June. And you know, and so forth, because it has no concept of the day. That's a hallucination. Then you ground it using rag, you know, rag light, I guess, simple rag, by just inserting the date. Okay, let's look at that. Jason, you you were playing with the uh, the temperature. Can you explain to the to the room what what that um, what that means? Yeah, so the temperature is what you see most demos change. Oh, what was it? I just passed it. Find temperature. OK, so I guess this is the top P. Huh, interesting. Um, the temp here. So this is the temperature to float. It's between zero and two. But it typically uh, is explained as in it is a spectrum of creativity that you want in the response so a lot of rag solutions are geared to zero because that you don't want creativity but if you're say doing um writing of some sort say fiction writing you would want to get gauge it closer to two the default is one, right? Middle of the road. A lot of the RAG systems will be zero or up to maybe 0.3, but not much more than that, that I've seen anyways. I'm not saying they all are. So this is the one I want. Nucle nucleus sampling factor is a different one. And yeah, so here, if it's set, then temperature is kind of um, ignored. It's going to be one or the other. But this one is geared more toward the sampling here. So, and it's between zero and one, I believe, because it's a percentage. Yeah. So, as an example, a value of point 0.1 will cause only the tokens comprising the top 10% of probability mass to be considered. Kind of. I mean, I can I can see the definition, read it to you, but you kind of have to play with it in your scenario to see what it does for your results. May or may if not. If you go to chat.bing.com, it, it has a um, a creativity measure that yeah. is. Um, All right. Let's see. It's uh, more creative than the middle on the left, more balanced in the middle, and more precise on the right. Uh, would that be temperature? Most likely. That's my guess. 
I know what's your opinion, Veronica. Sorry, what was the question? Where is it at, Bill? On the oh, bottom down there. Here? Yeah, so for Copilot or Bing Chat, the creative, balanced, precise, is that basically the temperature? Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. And then the um, Copilot in like Word and Outlook have the same idea, don't they? Mm -hmm. I don't have those running, so I've only seen demos. Yeah, I don't have those either, but they should, they, they're all based on um, the same approach. Um, I think uh, Pam was showing both top P and then the temperature. Um, most people just use temperature, um, but if you want extra creative, you can adjust both top P and uh, the temperature. Cool. Yeah, you kind of just have to play with it, see what works for you. Mm -hmm. I'll mention that in the code, um, there is a, a comment up the top uh, that says, um, do not do this in real code. It's a terrible idea uh, because I, in order to simplify this mini workshop, uh, rather than externalizing the 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 variables like the API key value, um, I burned them in. So I'm going to roll those. I'm going to roll that key at some point after after we hang up. So your your one page uh, AI machine will will uh, cease to work at, at that point. <laughs> Good idea. actually prepared um, a, a, a bash version, a PowerShell version, a command version, and I struggled with it and I ended up, I still have them, but I ended up uh, doing this just to, just to simplify. And uh, I, I, I don't know uh, how much it simplified it, but probably at least a little. Well, does anybody um, um, thank thank you all for for attending? I hope this was uh, useful for those of you newer to the to the uh, Azure AI world. Uh, does anybody have any uh, closing questions? Yeah, this is great. Thank you. And how how many tokens does the uh, Open Azure support? Like, um, I know normally they would charge, right? But in this case. Um, is it is it free for to use the uh, or how much how long we can use this if I keep running it? Well, I'm gonna roll the credentials after this uh, call ends, so we'll stop working. I see. So, I see. I see. You know, you know okay. five minutes. <laughs> uh, wow. It actually isn't free, uh, but it's not terribly expensive. This oh, is yes. tied to my personal credit card, okay. but it's it's not. Like it's not a lot of money to do what we did. That's if you look in the comments, you'll see I put a comment to not raise the max tokens above 250. So you could go, you know, everybody could go crazy and try to do a lot of stuff. Um, but I, you know, this felt like a this is experimental for for myself and uh, Veronica and Jason, and because we have to also figure out how to do what we're ever gonna whatever we're gonna do on the Azure um, day, uh, you know, the full day event on. April 20th, how do we light up this for everybody? Because it's not an easily available service. So um, I'll check the, the numbers later and see if this costs me more than a dollar. I, I don't expect that it will, though. I'd expect it to be pennies, if anything. So I hope that's uh, that's the best answer I have at the moment. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I I did run it some of sometimes and so didn't realize that's the case. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. I I think the volumes were at um, and it's kind of a, it's only uh, ten people left or something. Veronica or Jason, do either of you have any ideas how to like what this exercise that we did for this um, 
mini workshop, um, given the parameters that we were using and the, the volume that we were pumping into that, would you expect that to not even be a penny or what, what, any idea? Yeah, it should be really cheap. Yeah, I'd say less than a quarter. Um, uh, more or... than a penny, though. Yeah, all right. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is actually? Hold on, I can bring up the pricing. Open AI pricing. It's um, it's like it's kind of like it reminds me of storage. It was like per thousand type stuff. Uh, so is it GPT four or three five? It's uh three five turbo. Three five turbo. Of course, it's in the pricing page. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the, this doesn't tell me the model pricing. Oh, uh, that's for OpenAI. Um, I think yeah. Azure is charging something on top of it. Are they? So um, Azure OpenAI model pricing. And I don't know, try this one. Shit. This thing. Can't see because of the bar at the top. But this guy. Okay, so per thousand tokens. So for heading 250. Well, see, these are input output, but it does add up, but not a lot. I mean, thousand tokens, if you cap it at 250 and you hit the cap every time. Four of those, you're at this much. So times that by, you'd have to have like a hundred before you'd hit the five. I'll, um, I'll check the, uh, I, I actually have the cost analysis window popped up on the Azure side. And I'll see, I don't know how much latency there is before it catches up. It takes a while. Yeah. I, I I'll, use I'll that in my demo. Weekend. The, um, the, but I mean, this is a, a good thing to point out. I mean, look how much a, a price difference there is between GPT-4 with 32K and Turbo. I mean, it's huge. This is a cent, one penny for a hundred or a thousand tokens. Out and in. So you could easily right, so rack up a bill. Yeah. Right, right. I was watching a video, actually a couple of videos from the guys over at Langchain, and they've been doing testing on the context window, basically finding, I think they call it needle in the haystack. So they put like, I forget how many needles they were doing. Needles. So they put it, something in the context window that they're passing. They put it, we're putting like, one to seven they did multiple tests to see how often it would find those four things and it's so their test showed that the larger the window was the more often it paid attention to the end of the context it would sometimes lose things at the beginning of the context so yeah it's all interesting stuff Anyways, okay. so you did mention that you are going to have some kind of a workshop in the future. Like, is is it to uh, open to everyone? It, uh, I can answer that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's open to everyone. So we're this is a um, uh, an event that. Veronica and Jason and myself have put on a bunch of times over the years where we've been doing it for more than 10 years, where we have an all day uh, free, usually vendor sponsored so we can do food and, and such um, at NERD in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where uh, you show up with a laptop or, you know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll publish a, a page that describes all this, but show up at usually it's around 8 30 or 9 or something and at the at the site 
and you bring your laptop, like I mentioned, and we code. We do stuff. There's a, usually a, a, an interwoven set of talks, like like the Pamela talk that you just heard, um, for, as a you know one example. There might be a talk like that, and then there'd be um, a hands-on experience after that to take advantage of the information there. And then you know uh, you repeat that three, four, five, six times during the day. You know, new topic, new lab, new topic, new lab, that kind of thing. And at the end of the day, um, you uh, you leave uh, presumably having learned a bunch more about Azure. You know, this is the Boston Azure group, uh, but we're um, uh, we're we're expecting to have a heavy AI emphasis on um, on this particular workshop on uh, April twentieth. Well, that's great. I would love to. I'm in New Jersey, but I would love to come there and join it. Love to have you. Great. Well, so watch the meetup space. There'll be a sign up um, soon. Um, we like uh, we we only found out about this uh, quite this was quite recently. This is late breaking news. So we have a couple of details to square away now that we know we have space, but we'll we'll get a sign up form out there and. Um, if you, uh, you should, you know, uh, assuming you get meetup notifications, that should um, should let you know. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. Have you been to any in-person uh, Boston Azure or North Boston Azure events? No, no, I I haven't come to any Boston Azure events, but I did go to some in New York, New York City. Ah, very cool. Well, welcome. Thank you. Any other um, questions out there, folks? We let everybody go. Sounds good. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks for staying late. All. Oh, uh, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> you got to. Good night, like everybody. Forrest Gump. What's he say? I'm tired. I'm gonna go home now. <laughs> yes, that, that's nice. how I feel. That's what I'm gonna Two do. Two and a half hours. So this is great. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.